Language masks oppression and feeds into it. And each time we as researchers set up couched in the language of the status quo or in the language of evasion, we feed into these oppressions. Each time we use politically correct terms instead of telling it as it is, we feed into this oppression. Each time we fail to challenge the reality because we do not have the voice that allows us to step outside the political correctness, we fail to address the reality of millions of people's lives and we in fact, I think, further entrench them into the very kinds of conditions we wish to liberate them from. Language makes us cautious, it makes us dishonest, and in the end it can dis it disempower us and the communities where we wish to work. And through language, and particularly in most of our AIDS work, we have created categories of difference and exclusion where we should be striving for inclusion and belonging. UN agencies, with all their efforts not to offend, not to be confrontational or controversial, have created this bland homogenization of the epidemic, have lulled us into a world of understanding and explanation, which is neither, seduced us into a world of order and certainty, which it isn't, and corralled us into conformity about responses and interventions, which simply refuse to see or acknowledge that this epidemic flourishes in countries where there are evasions, prevarications, and a desire to con constantly prevent the, present the world as it is, rather than as it should be. It is incumbent upon us now, I think, as social researchers, to try and rescue AIDS from its historical past. We need to step aside for a moment and reflect on what we have learned over the last three decades, and how this may support the creation of a new agenda for AIDS research and prevention interventions. Briefly, I want to mention here two programs that we have been part of, which I think to some extent have transformed the ways in which the theory that underpins our knowledge of AIDS prevention translates perhaps into the practice of intervention. A few years ago, a member of the SADC Parliamentary Forum and I were in discussion about political leadership. We agreed that it seemed a fairly weak and ineffectual conception of leadership that premiers or cabinet ministers or indeed MPs should be tested. Rather, it was a question of getting politicians to develop a complex social scientific understanding of the epidemic, its social drivers, and the interplay of structural, personal, and social interventions. But how to do this? Members of parliament claim to be busy, and they are certainly not elected for their social scientific rigor. We decided that a program of action could be to train and place young interns into selected African parliaments who would act as research assistants and who would develop a body of knowledge about the epidemic in those countries and the region that would inform debates and action. These interns were all young University of Pretoria LLM graduates trained in African human rights law and trained in HIV and AIDS social and political theory. They were placed in 11 parliaments to look at issues such as treatments, gender, orphans, healthcare, human rights, poverty, and the social drivers of the epidemic. In addition, an intern from the International Association of Women with AIDS was placed in the communities to research community needs and act as a liaison between the lawmakers and the general public. These interns were required to do a great deal of research. They were required to read what was current and to critique this through their, albeit quite limited, but I think quite good, understanding of social and political theory. They were required to ask the difficult questions that challenge the taken for granted certainties that people give in relation to the epidemic and society. And they were certainly required to challenge the ways in which race, class, and culture, and gender are framed and debated in all of these societies and parliaments. And through this work, we required that they generated research questions and research interests. Now, of course, the successes were mixed and varied. In some countries, a co particularly, I would say, Namibia, a cohort of fascinated and engaged politicians developed, laws were changed, as in Kenya, and interventions planned that would address some of the most pressing social issues and service delivery. In others, however, there was extreme anger and frustration from the MPs, the UN agencies as donors, as their taken for granted certainties were challenged. But there is a serious area in which success has not happened, and that is in the surge of pending legislation to criminalize HIV in many African countries. 
So how do we understand this? How should, react, should we react to it? How do we accept that politicians who are prepared to take big steps forward on some issues will take such huge steps backwards on others? At the centre, we understand this to be in part due to the paucity of social theory generally in our societies and due to the fact that we have still not developed the language about sexual and social and political rights that can challenge the language of power, the language of religion or culture. We understand that in part it comes from a frustration that despite very high levels of infection and death and high levels of information, people are still not vigilant enough about condoms or seem to be changing their behavior. And we understand it in part from the anxiety that unless societies show results, funding will dry up and it highlights the dangers of a, of a results-driven funding agenda where log frames and activities and outcomes simply do not fit onto log frames and simply do not work in an issue as complex as HIV and AIDS. But it is also a consequence of the ways in which social research and HIV prevention has developed in our institutions of higher learning and the ways in which they have not yet had the power to change how the powerful think and act. In part, it is due to the fact that the medical voice, the voice of the UN and the donors is stronger and their interventions and solutions are easier. It is much easier to test. It is much harder to think about what is needed to develop social understandings of the test, of how and why people test and how and why people take their treatments. And it is much harder to ensure good counseling and ongoing support. It is much easier to circumcise. It is much harder to challenge the findings of the trials and to convince of the potential social damage such an intervention will cause. And the politicians and the policy makers and the donors, while claiming to be fascinated with the social, will be corralled into the biomedical because that is where the money is and that is where the numbers can be counted. The second story comes from Hammonds Kral. Hammonds Kral is a peri-urban area close to Pretoria. It has a very complex history under apartheid what was, and was what was known as a resettlement area, a place where displaced people were taken, a reservation perhaps, if you like. This history of Hammond Kral means that even now there is a fractured community, the old community and the new community that was moved there. It is an extremely uneasy place now governed across two provinces with very high rates of HIV infection, large numbers of orphans and elderly caregivers, and a volatile and hostile population to HIV and AIDS and ways to address them. The University of Pretoria has an external campus on Hammonds Kral, and there we established what has become known as The Place. It is a legal advice office that offers community legal support for people addressing HIV and AIDS issues. We have the free services of 15 attorneys and a growing number of community trained and based paralegal field workers. The underlying belief was that in addition to some form of social capital, there needs of course to be legal capital and we need to work to develop a strong understanding of the law as an enabling rather than as a punitive institution. To ensure that the paralegals have a suitable environment in which to work we have expanded the intern idea from the SADC Parliamentary Forum and we have developed an extensive training and support work with magistrates, with court orderlies, with the police, so that they have perhaps not a well-developed but a good understanding of social science and social theory in the hope that this may in influence how they understand the cases and the issues that come before them and may influence the ways in which they impose sentences. We have interns working in the magistrates' courts, in the police stations, in community centres, and in the local hospital, which is an ARV rollout site. Now, these interns are young community workers who now understand the law, who understand about how the law can and should be used, and who understand the social drivers of the epidemic and the ways in which these make people more or less likely to be infected and more or less likely to be able to prevent infection. They are not particularly well trained in basic issues of HIV, such as transmission, but they are extremely well trained in social issues and in the ways in which social development programs play out. What has been interesting about these two interventions is to think of AIDS prevention and research and policy and systems that moves away from the obvious into the darker world of the unknown, 
Does a legal support network that expands social understandings of rights, the law, and AIDS into the judiciary support AIDS prevention? It's possibly too early to tell, but it has certainly created a space for community and policy discussion, and through that we believe opens the way for people to talk about prevention through new and expanded wide-angle lenses. Does having interns in parliaments contribute to AIDS prevention? Again, it's hard to tell, but it certainly does give the facility for the parliamentarians and community people to interrogate the laws and to think about how policies can be implemented. And I think essentially what we have achieved in both of these um, interventions is to have created some uncertainty. And I think uncertainty is essential for people who wish to develop policy practice and research. I think for all of us, it is almost harder now than ever before to do good AIDS work and good AIDS research because we seem to have been doing it for so long. So we need now, I think, to find this new wide angle lens. We need, as I said, to rescue AIDS from its historical past. So how do we position ourselves and our research so that our voices of those of authority and command respect? I'm not suggesting that we have no authority or no respect, but I am interested about who frames the research questions and who is the voice of power. And for now, certainly in the AIDS world, that voice is the biomedical, and the juggernaut of prevention technologies steams on with the potential to undermine much of the work that we have done in prevention and care. So to return to Edward Said, who I think was one of the finest public intellectuals of the 20th century. He, as you may know, was always concerned to link theory to practice. Constantly critical, he was always challenging and always provocative. Said was primarily a historian of ideas, and he was interested in discourse, the stories he said a society tells itself and the stories by which society misunderstands itself and sometimes understands itself. He has written compellingly on culture and on the role of intellectuals in society. It is his belief in the role of intellectuals and the public intellectual in particular that I think should form the basis of our future understanding of HIV AIDS prevention and research and which I think would allow us to try and rescue AIDS from its historical past. Our work should be intensely political, and we need to become much louder public intellectuals. The public intellectual is the world's eye on the world. For Said, the role of the public intellectual is to advance human freedom and knowledge. Often standing outside of society and often condemned by society its institution and its institutions, the role of the intellectual is to disturb and unsettle the status quo. The intellectual is, of course, part of society, but also has to stand outside of society. It has to address concerns as to a wider audience as possible. For as Said said, I think it has to be supposed that many arguments can be made to more than one audience in different situations. Otherwise, we would be dealing with not an intellectual argument, but either with dogma or with technological jargon designed specifically to repel all but a small handful of initiates or coteries. Given how social theory has been positioned in this epidemic, I sense that it has still to a large extent to appreciate the full implications of its complex lo location in society and in the AIDS world of UN agencies, PEPFAR numbers, testing, circumcision, culture, and the biomedical frameworks and language. Going forward in our AIDS work, we must reflect on the place and obligation of the intellectual in society and the multiple audience and constituencies that we must feel compelled to address. UN AIDS and other UN agencies, PEPFAR and many donors, represent an attempt to depoliticize technocratic expertise, so expertly used by biomedics, and we need to reflect on whether we have in one way or another exhibited a scholarly complicity with the creation of this technocratic expertise. 